In this program, we're going to talk about the hazards we find in modern vehicles. We've seen a lot of changes in the cars over the last several years. We've seen changes in airbags, we've seen changes in seatbelt retentioners, we've seen changes in the metal used in the cars. Those all come together to affect how we do our extrications. We're going to go ahead and talk about the specifics of those and give you the best information we can. This is important because the second most common call we respond on are car wrecks. We've seen changes in how the cars are put together, we've seen changes in our response models, and we've also seen changes in patient injuries. We need to make sure that we don't become part of those injuries by understanding the cars and how they're put together. Understanding these changes are very important. The cars that we respond to today are absolutely nothing like the cars that we responded to 20 years ago. The cars that we're cutting on the road really don't represent the cars that we're cutting in the drill ground. So we have to understand these changes and know how to apply the changes to the real life incidents and how to be safe about what we do. Modern vehicles have a lot more hazards in them compared to older vehicles. When we do our training, we're training on older vehicles and it's pretty easy to do our cuts on the drill ground. When we get real world, we've got a lot more hazards to be concerned about. These hazards tend to slow our operation down on scene. As our operation slows down, our scene time increases. As our scene time increases, patient survivability decreases. The goal of this program is going to be able to give you a good understanding of the hazards. So once you understand the hazards, you can decrease our scene time, which is going to increase patient survivability. Let's talk about the concerns with propulsion. When we throw up on vehicles that are conventional powered, we're going to have flammable liquids. We've got flammable liquids down on the ground, what are we going to do to control that? The easiest thing we found is by putting down absorbent, so putting down kitty litter. It tends to give us some good traction on the ground, keeps us from sliding on it, as well as it holds the vapors in place for us. Next one we look at is our hybrid vehicles. Primary concern with the hybrid vehicles is going to be punctured battery and having the battery leaking on the ground. Some agencies are carrying a base. They can put down the base onto the ground to neutralize the acid. If you don't carry a base, the other option you have is kind of go back to remember our hazmat training. The solution to pollution is dilution. About 500 gallons of water onto that will go ahead and neutralize it and we shouldn't have an issue for us. On our alternative powered vehicles, the two most commonly find are propane and hydrogen. So think about on scene. Now my hydrogen is lighter than air. If we had a leak, it's going to go up and go away. If we had propane heavier than air, we're going to have that gas is going to come out and it's going to hit the ground. It's heavier than air, so it's going to run around the ground. If it's run along the ground, what we've got to be thinking about is controlling it as far as where is that going to go? Is there any ignition sources? If we need to control it, we can utilize a fan and, correct an, and direct an airflow to blow it away from where we're working. Or also be thinking about where we're parking rigs or if there's anything else in the area that could cause the ignition for us. We're going to talk about automobile restraint systems. We're going to run through airbags, locations, and how they work. We're going to talk about the seatbelt pretensioners as well as the rollover protection bars. In this video, we're going to show you that we're going to talk about airbag hazards and show you where you should not be standing. Tremendous explosion. I felt myself ejected from the car, violently propelled from the car, as a matter of fact, landing on my back. At that point, I had no idea what happened, whether the tool had blown up, the car itself had blown up. You've just seen the video of a firefighter getting hit by a deploying airbag. Something to be thinking about, we have the injuries to the firefighter. What did the rest of the crew do during that injury? Do they stop patient care and divert it to the firefighter as well? As that happens, what happens to my scene time? And again, what happens to patient care during that? The point to take away from this is looking at how we operate. Where we position our bodies 20 years ago on cars versus where we position our bodies now. When we're talking about patient care removal techniques versus now versus then. A lot of these are changing based on these hazards. If I know that there's a certain part of the car that's a danger to me, I'm going to change where I stand. And when I change where I stand, that's ultimately going to change the techniques of how we bring patients out. Airbag locations in the cars have gone from one airbag to two airbags. Now we're pushing 17 to 20 airbags in a car. Location-wise, it's absolutely everywhere in the cars. We have in front of the driver, they're in front of the passenger. We have side impact bags. We have front and center bags. We have bags come down out of the roof, bags come out of the doors, bags come down out of the knees, bags that come through the hood of the car, the front of the car. So we've got to be aware of these bags, where they're at, based on where these bags are at and where they deploy, that's where we don't want to be. With all these airbags in a car, you might think it would slow down your extrication. The reality of it is, if we modify our techniques and understand where the airbags are at, where the danger zones are at, we can still complete a quick and effective extrication. Let's talk about the airbag sensors. The original style sensors in the bag, they utilized this sensor right here. Within the sensor was a ball bearing that sat on two magnets. When the car would get into a collision, it would pop the ball bearing off the magnets, that's what would initiate the airbag deployment. 
The issue we've run into, a lot of these older sensors are starting to fail even though they've never been in a car wreck. If you listen closely, you can actually hear the, the ball bearing rattling inside. This is a sensor that's never been in a wreck, but this could actually fire off the airbags. Because of that, we're seeing the manufacturers change it to new style sensors. To get away from the issue with the old style sensors, manufacturers have now moved to a new style sensor. What they'll do is they'll take and they run wire through the car. So this will represent the wire that's running through the door. We'll push power on one side, I'll have a sensor on the other side. Driving down the road, we're fine. When the car gets T-boned, the door bends. As the door bends, our wire is going to bend. Once we start to bend the wire, we're going to create resistance. This resistance will drop the voltage we're seeing on this side. That drop in voltage is going to deploy the airbag. When we look at forward stuff and we're talking about changes in techniques, one of the things we're looking at on our cars is we have to get away from bending these wires. So we don't want to walk up to the car and, and completely bend that door in half. We start bending the door in half, we start manipulating the door, we run that risk of moving the wire. We start running, moving the wire, we potentially could fire off an airbag. When we talk about our techniques, we've got our wiring here. One of the techniques that's always been taught in the past was to attack the door from the latch side. When I attack the door from the latch side, we end up shoving the door in to get that latch open. When I start shoving that door in, what are we doing to this wire? We're pushing the wire in. So instead, our change that we go forward with this, we want to attack the hinges. If we can attack the hinges, then instead of bending the wire in, the wire stays straight with the door and we actually take the door off as one piece and it comes out for us clean and easy. Once we start to get the door off, some of the question comes into the wire loom itself. We've got the wire loom in here and people are concerned, well, if we start cutting that, are we going to fire off the airbags? So the nice thing for us on the sensors, they're smart sensors. They understand if we're looking at, let's say, for example, three millivolts of power passing through here, we start to bend it, that changes the sensor from three millivolts to two millivolts, and it understands that. If I leave that wire straight and we come here and we just simply cut that whole wire loom, when that comes off, that sensor goes from three millivolts to no millivolts and it understands that and it shuts the system down. Question from there comes into, well, why would we be cutting on a car with a battery intact? Well, we've seen with new cars, the batteries are changing. We're not seeing them in the engine compartment anymore. A lot of the batteries are going to the rear seat, underneath the rear passenger seat, and we're also seeing them in the trunk. When we start getting some of those locations, they're a lot more difficult to get. The battery's a priority for us on scene to get cut, but it's not going to be a game stopper. If we can't find it, we're going to have to keep going. We need to be aware of that and be thinking about that during our extrication. As we talked about compressing this wire for the sensor, one of the things to look at is a technique that's been taught forever. The technique was to bring your spreader in, put it in the door opening right here, spread, the op spread it open in an effort to gap this area. As we go forward and we talk about our changes in our wires and changes in the cars, as I start to gap that, what are we doing to the door? We're compressing the door. As we start to compress the door, we're going to change that wire position. The other thing we have in the door with the airbags, we've got a compressed gas cylinder inside of the door that runs the airbag. If we start squishing that compressed gas cylinder, what's going to happen? We potentially could grenade it. So again, not a bad technique back in the day, but going forward, it's a technique we want to shelf. In this video, we're going to show you the door gap technique. This is what we don't want to use anymore. As you see, as the spreader opens, we're manipulating the door. We manipulate the door, we could potentially cause issues for us. As you can see in the picture here of the door, we've got the airbag sensors in there. We also have the compressed gas cylinder that runs the airbag. This is why we don't want to do that vertical push gap anymore, because we're manipulating too many parts of the car. When we go forward, we talk about it. Is this an old car? Is it a new car? I can't tell anymore. So this is why we're going to shelf that old technique and just leave it alone and not do it anymore. As we start talking about the newer techniques and newer cars, if I try to differentiate on scene, is this an old car with old techniques, a new car with new techniques, we're going to end up choosing the wrong technique for the wrong car. What we want to kind of go forward with is just always treat every car like it's a new car. If we utilize new techniques on a new car, we're safe. If we utilize new techniques on an old car, we're still safe. Our concern comes from an old technique on a new car, and that's what we want to just get rid of those and just shift forward. And everything we do from going forward, we treat every car like it's a new car, and we're going to be safe. Let's talk about airbags and how they work. We're going to start off with the old style airbags, which were run after sodium azide. On the sodium azide, we'd have a chemical that sat inside the bag. We get ready to fire it off, ignition source would come up, ignite the sodium azide, 
and as the sodium azide burned, the off gas is what would inflate the bag. Concerns that we have is sodium azide coming out about 3,000 degrees. So if we show up on scene, we've got an undeployed airbag, we've got departments that would want to take and go ahead and cut the undeployed airbag. That way if it fired off, we wouldn't have the airbag hitting our patient. Well, if we cut the airbag, where's that 3,000 degree gas now going to go into the patient? From there, if we think about it, this is an explosion. So we also have departments that say, hey, I don't want this thing exploding on our patient. So what we do is we'll take and we'll wrap duct tape or throw a chain around the steering wheel. That way we don't have that thing coming out and hitting our patient. Well, main difference between an explosion and a bomb is containment. As soon as I take that explosion and I contain it now by, by confining it in place, we've now created a bomb. So the best thing for us on scene to do is just realize that that is an explosion, that is an area of danger for us. So we get on scene, where do we not want to put our bodies? In front of the steering wheel. Where do we not want to have the patient be sitting? In front of the steering wheel. So when we get on scene, we're going to scoot that seat back a little bit. That way we're, we're clearing that danger zone. We're not going to stick our head in there right in front of them in that danger zone. Going forward, our airbags are all running on a pressurized gas cylinder. Within the cylinder, we actually have an explosive charge that sits in the base of the cylinder. We've got compressed gas inside. This gas is up to 9,500 PSI. And then we've got the discharge port that goes to fire off and inflates the airbag. Running down the road, we've got our pressure sitting in here. Wires come up to here. When we get ready to fire off the airbag, ignition source comes up. It pops a little explosive charge in here, which detonates and bumps the pressure inside the cylinder up. As the cylinder pressure bumps up, comes out and inflates the airbag. When we're doing our extrications, we're always talking about doing our peel and peaks. This is what we're looking for is this cylinder. If we find that cylinder, it's probably not where we want to cut. So we want to make sure that we either cut below it or cut above it and, and stay away from the cylinder itself. Traditional airbags had one stage, they'd fire off and that was it. Going forward, most of our cars are all now going to dual stage bags. So what happens is the bag can inflate. Once it's inflated, it actually has a secondary charge that can inflate again. I'm going to show you a video of a dual stage bag. We're going to fire it off, show you the first bag firing. From there, we're going to actually going to set it off again and show you the same bag deploying again. Where this is a concern to us on scene, we get there, we start working around the car. I've got a deployed airbag. Used to be would show up, bags deployed. I felt it was safe to work around that bag. Well, now with the dual stage bags, we don't know if it's fired off once or twice. So we've still got to treat that bag like it's live and it's going to come at us whether it's deployed or not. Always treat it that way. We are now seeing cars go into dual stage bags. The reason we see dual stage bags, car goes off the road, takes a tree, airbag inflates. It bounced off one tree, takes a secondary tree. Now the bag can inflate a second time. That way we're protecting the occupants more, more through the different collisions. The concern for us, again, we just showed you the bag that's deployed once. I'm going to show you the same car with the same bag and it's actually going to just fire off a second time on us. Three, two, one. That was a smaller one. On deployment speed of these front airbags, steering wheel bag comes out about 200 miles an hour, passenger bag's coming out about 400 miles an hour. If you're thinking about that on scene, if I've had somebody who's been hit with the airbag on a car wreck, make sure we treat them appropriately based on the actual impact that they've received. Also think about where you're putting your body. Traditionally, I've had, if I showed up and we had a driver was my patient, do we put one of us sitting in the passenger seat leaning up against the dash while we're working on the patient? Well, now you're leaning up against a 400 mile an hour airbag. We want to be careful of that and be aware of our surroundings. I'm going to show you two videos. First video is going to be a steering wheel airbag firing off. Second video is going to be a passenger side airbag firing off. What I want you to do is listen to the boom and watch the size of the bag to get a better understanding when we're talking about the deployment speed and the size of the bags. Listen to the boom and watch the size of the bag. Three, two, one. Now we're going to show you the passenger bag. Listen to how much louder the boom is and how much bigger the bag is. <laughs> All right, side impact airbags. These bags are going to be coming out of multiple locations. They're built into the seat back themselves. They're built into the B post. They're also built into the doors. Depending on the year, make, model, car, they can come out of any of those locations. We need to be prepared for that and be aware of where they're coming from and just be aware of not getting ourselves in front of them. As I show you this video of a side impact bag to airbag deploying, be thinking about our patient, where they're at, and how we're taking them out. Traditionally, we've always been taught to pull the people out the side of the car. We're putting ourselves in front of this airbag. We're putting the patient in front of the airbag. We go forward, one of the big shifts we're looking at for patient removal is actually going straight out the back, so we're not in front of that. But again, watch this video and think about what this is going to do to us. Okay, you guys ready? Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Jeez. Okay, three, two, one. 
Next airbag we're showing you is a front center airbag. This comes out in between the driver and in between the passenger. It helps in a sideways collision from having the passenger leaning over and hitting the driver or vice versa. Again, where this becomes an issue for us, when we're doing our traditional patient removal of out the side, we're going to take and twist the patient and we're going to lay them down in front of this airbag. As we start scooting the patient out the side of the car, we're now in front of the airbag. So again, as we go forward, we're shifting towards taking the people straight out the back of the car. When I take you out the back of the car, we're not putting ourselves or the patient in front of this airbag, and that's our safety zone. These are our head protection bags. These are going to drop down out of the roof. They'll start off at the front of the A post and run all the way back to the C or the D post. And again, we want to be thinking about these as far as our patient removal and our egress into doing patient care. If I start leaning into the patient, into the window to do patient care, are we putting our head in that danger zone? When we do our extrication, one of the big things we really work on is taking the entire roof off. When the entire roof goes away, so does the danger of these airbags. All right, I'm going to show you a video of a head protection bag deploying. So again, be thinking about it. If we're leaning inside the car doing patient care, what's our danger zone? If we're trying to take patients out and this thing fires off, what's the danger to the patient? So again, as we go forward, we take the whole roof off, this whole danger goes away. One. Holy crap. One. Scares me all right, we're looking at knee airbags. So these, again, are there to protect the patient in the head-on collisions. We're finding in head-on collision, the patient actually comes forward, the head and the chest hit the airbag, which protect them from injuries there, but the body continues down underneath the lap belt. As they go underneath the lap belt, we're getting lower spine injuries, and we also have the knees come forward, the knees hit the dash, that energy transfers back, and we end up with a broken femurs or broken pelvis. This airbag is there to help reduce those injuries to our patients. I'm going to show you the headrest airbag. Next. The airbag is in the headrest. Watch it fire off and protect the head from hyperextending and causing injuries. Main thing to keep in the back of your mind, when we do have that headrest airbag, there's a gas cylinder built into that seat somewhere that pressurizes and fires off that headrest. When, if we're having to cut the seat back out or go through the seat for patient removal, make sure you do a really good peel and peek, get that cloth away, get the leather off, Expose that seat so you can find that cylinder and don't cut through it. Next thing we're finding in our cars are seat belts that are actually have airbags integrated into them. We start doing our extrication, we have that airbag fire off, again it can cause us an issue. We show up on scene, one of the first things we're going to do is cut seat belts, that resolves this issue. When we are cutting our seat belts, if we have cut the seat belt and there is an airbag in there and there is a deployment, these have a low enough air volume and a quick enough discharge time that they're not going to cause an issue for us. They will simply discharge the air through the loose end of the seat belt. Watch the airbag deploy off the seat belt. This is kind of what you're going to expect to find with the patient. Next bag we're finding on the car are the auto ped bags. These are actually coming out in between the front windshield and the outside of the car. This does two things for us. It protects on the pedestrian hits. If we have somebody hits the pedestrian, it keeps it from impacting the windshield and causing damage. If we have an animal strike, it's going to help keep the animal from actually coming through the windshield and hurting our driver or our passenger in the front seat. All right, when we talk about doing our vehicle extrication, something's really important before we make any of our cuts is we need to do our peel and peaks. We need to make sure we know what we're cutting through. When we're looking at our peel and peaks, one of the things we're looking at is our gas cylinders. So cylinder location is absolutely everywhere in the cars. There is no rhyme, make, reason anymore. They are everywhere. So we're going to find them in the dash, we're going to find them in the A post, we're going to find them in B post, we're going to find them in roof rails up above us. Anywhere you find the cylinder, that's where we don't want to cut. Remember, we're doing our peel and peaks. We're, we need to primarily look at where we're going to cut. If I'm cutting at the bottom of the door, that's where I need to do my peel and peaks. Once I've cleared the area that I'm going to cut, we're okay. I don't need to search the rest of the car if I'm not cutting at it. As far as doing the peel and peaks themselves, just a $10 little mini pry bar works perfect for us. So you get that, it's small, it gets into where we need to do our work. When we're looking at our cylinders, remember, we're pushing 9,500 PSI on these cylinders, which is quite a bit to cut through, and we don't want that to happen. When we do our peel and piece, we find our gas cylinder, we want to cut either above it or below it. My preference is to go down below, that way you take the whole cylinder goes away with the roof. This one here though, if you look at the location of that cylinder, we're going to have to cut above it. When we're cutting above it, the question comes into where do I cut it at? The safest place to cut, we've got a little, we've circled it there for you on the picture, there's a little stainless steel clamp that clamps the bag to the discharge port of the cylinder. I know that below that clamp is pressure, Above that clamp is just bag. So when we show up to make our cuts, we cut above the clamp. If we're going to cut below it, and we still have wires connected to it, 
not a big deal. When we cut our wires, what we want to do is don't cut the wires both at the same time. Either cut them one at a time, or you can actually just take and unplug the wire harness directly off the back of the cylinder and we're able to go. The main thing we're looking for as far as cutting these guys, we're not concerned about a drop in voltage, but it's actually an increase. So if we were to cut through them both and we had an electrical issue going on or we had a static charge on us, we could accidentally fire off the bag that way. So that's why one wire at a time or disconnect it. When we do our peel and peaks, if we miss our cylinder and cut through it, one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to grenade or the cylinder is going to take off. First video we're going to show you is a cylinder grenading. Watch all the shrapnel and think about where that's going on scene. Second video we're going to show you is the cylinder itself just jettisoning and taking off and bouncing around the car. So think about both those situations. If it shrapnels, where is that shrapnel going to go? If the tube jettisons and starts taking off in the car, what's it looking for? Answer something soft and squishy. Who's soft and squishy? We are. Okay. As we cut through the cylinder, watch where the cylinder and watch where it goes. As the airbags are continuing to develop, some other additional airbags we, find, we expect to find in the future are going to be airbags underneath the feet. And that goal of those is in a head-on collision, those will inflate and actually shove the feet out of that crumple zone. The other airbag that we're looking at, remember we talked earlier about where the person is actually torpedoing out from underneath the lap belt? They're actually looking at developing airbags that go underneath the knees that will actually inflate and help hold you in position of the seat and keep you from coming out forward. But again, as we go forward with the cars, expect more changes, it's coming. One of the best resources to keep up on cars and their changes is the auto body industry. These are the people that are taking the cars apart, putting them together for a living. They understand the cars, they know the cars the best. Hook up with a good shop and have them keep you up to speed. Airbag safety. Main thing we're looking at for the airbag safety is we've talked about is our danger zones. Where is my danger zones? Where do I want to stay away from? Best rule of thumb is figure five inches off the sides of the cars, 10 inches away from the steering wheel, 20 inches from the passenger side is where we want to be away up from the car. Not very many people are carrying a tape measure in their pocket to try to figure out where do I stand on the car. Best thing to just simply do is just know those areas and stay away from them. Next thing we have on the cars are our seatbelt retentioners. Seatbelt retentioners are in there to actually take and tighten the seatbelt in a collision. What that does, when our airbag inflates, we kind of have a, like a strike zone that we need to hit. If my seatbelt is loose, we can actually miss that strike zone and cause more damage to us. The seatbelt retentioner actually tensions up and pulls you into position so we can come forward and make contact where we should on that airbag. All right, we're going to show you a video of a seatbelt retentioner tightening up on our patient. The main thing I want you to watch for on this is when the seatbelt retracts, it does not release. This is where we get on scene and we start having issues or complications with patient care. We get on scene in the real world, we're going to cut that seatbelt. One of the reasons we cut that seatbelt is going to be because of these and we can release that tension. Three, two, one. Wow. The easiest way to safety the airbags is by cutting the battery. Traditionally, we found the battery in the engine compartments. We get in there, find the battery, you want to cut our cables. When we cut our cables, cut the ground first. After we make one cut, you want to go ahead and come down another six inches and make a secondary cut. That way, as we're doing the extrication, if the cables are moving around, they can't reconnect and touch ends and recharge the system. As we go forward with our newer cars, we're no longer finding the batteries in the engine compartment. A lot of manufacturers are shifting the batteries back of the car. We're finding them a lot of times underneath the rear passenger seat and in the trunk of the car. We show up on scene, if I'm not sure where the battery's at or I don't know if there's power to the car, one of the easiest things for us to do is go in there and turn on the four-way flashers. If I got flashers going off the car, then I know I've got still have 12-volt power. If we have no flashers, then 12-volt power is shut and we're good to go to the next step. As we just talked about, turning on our four-way flashers gives us a good idea whether we have 12-volt power or not. If we've cut the 12 volt battery and I still have flashers, then I know I've got an alternative power source coming from somewhere. Older cars, it might be a cell phone, iPod, GPS, could be backfeeding the car. Newer cars, if we've gone in there and somebody's put in an aftermarket stereo system or alarm system, that could backfeed the car and still keep it energized. So be aware of that and be looking for that on scene. Again, if we find it and it's still blinking, we're gonna try to do our best to be aware of it and try to cut it. If I can't get those batteries cut, we're gonna still have to complete the extrication with the power live. A lot of times we'll get the question, where are the airbags at? What cars have airbags? There's too many cars to remember them all and trying to look at a car after a wreck and try to figure it out is really difficult. So one of the best things we've found for us on scenes 
is we can take and work with dispatch, we can call out a license plate and try to get them to give us back the car that it makes, or we can try off of a VIN number off the car to determine it. From there, we can look up a resource and figure out what we've got going on for the cars. Once we know the car that we're dealing with, we can take and pull up an app off of our, either our smartphone or off of a tablet, and we can actually pull up the car and look at what the car has. We can figure out where the airbags are at, we can figure out where the batteries are at, or any other hazards that are in that car. On the apps that are available, there are free apps and there are apps that cost up to $15 per app. When you're paying that, you get what you pay for. So the more money you pay for the app, the more complete the database is and the more detailed the drawings are. Other hazards we have to consider in our cars, we've got lift struts, bumper struts, vehicle contents or cargo that could be issues for us, high intensity discharge lights, pop-up roll bars, and car fire hazards. When we show up and we've got a hatchback that we need to cut through, the gas struts aren't a big concern for us. We're going to go ahead and cut through them in this video. What I want you to listen for, the cutter is going to come across, and once it pierces the cylinder, you're going to hear that pressure bleed off. As soon as we start to hear the pressure bleed, we're going to stop operation, let the pressure bleed out. There's only about 200 PSI in there. Once the pressure is done bleeding, we'll finish the cut. Next thing we're looking at is our loaded front bumper. So what we're talking about here is we've actually got gas struts that are built into the bumper that will compress or release when the car gets in a low speed impact, typically like in a parking lot. Concern we have with this is if we have any issues with uh, direct uh, flame impingement and a fire, these things could fail and come off and uh, hurt us. Contents and cargo. So what we're talking about here be thinking about, we show up to a car, got somebody unconscious inside the car, what's inside that car as far as a hazard to us? Was it a suicide? Did they put in there some sort of a gas that's displaced the oxygen? We want to be aware of that if we open that car up to gain access to that patient. The other one we're looking at is cargo. So if we've got a vehicle, an over the road truck that's been placarded, we kind of know what's in there. When we find rental trucks that are being moved around, there's not necessarily a requirement for them to be placarded. Be a lot more cautious when you have moving vans or just miscellaneous rental vans that are tipped up on their side, be aware that the cargo could be mixed and we could have some issues inside. HID headlights cause some people concern. They're basically, it's a very bright headlight and people are thinking that there could be electrical issues with them. Reality is the HID headlights run at 25,000 volts. A taser runs at 50,000 volts. So as far as if you get in there and you hit that with your Halligan tool, you kind of get what you deserve. It's, it's gonna hurt, but it's not gonna kill you. On our convertible cars, we're finding pop-up roll bars. The main concern we have with this, as the car starts to tip sideways, there will be a certain angle that those bars will come up. If we have to reposition the car on scene, be aware of those and watch out for things that come up out of the car. All right, car fire, suppression, and safety concerns. We're going to hit these really quick. We're going to talk about airbags, loaded bumpers, lift struts, and fires with carbon fiber. On this video, we're looking at car fires and looking at the airbags themselves. When we have those compressed gas cylinders running the airbags in a car fire, the compressed gas cylinder is going to heat up. It can get to that point where it fails. Be thinking about that on the car fire itself. When I have direct flame impingement, we've got a danger. Rather than walking up to the car to put it out, knock it out from a distance and then go up to the car and mop it up. Next video for you is the car fire with a loaded front bumper. When you watch the video, you're going to kind of see some movement of the video. You're going to hear a loud boom. And then you can look down and see a firefighter on the ground. Front bumper came off, dual tip fibs. Yeah, it's gonna back up traffic for just a bit. Hey, it's a good thing I'm ahead of it. <laughs> Whoa, one guy down. So again, on our car fires, our primary concern as far as things going boom on us is when we have direct flame impingement. The whole goal, knock it down from a distance. Once I take away that heat, we're going to take away that hazard. Now we get close to the car and finish up our task. All right, our gas struts, we find these guys in the engine compartment and we find them in the hatchbacks of the cars. The primary concern we have with these is, is during car fires. We have direct flame impingement from a fire burning on these guys. Pressure is going to go up. As that pressure goes up, they can fail. See here, this is one, one stuck through a garage door. What happens if you happen to be standing in front of it? Watch this gas strut go boom. And as we talked about before, think about a gas strut and when it comes out of the car, if you're in the wrong place, it ends up inside you. And that's not going to feel very good. 
So remember on our car fires, our dangers we have, I've got my front bumper, my rear bumper, that could be on the cars, right? Those could come off. We also have our lift struts that could hold up the hood, or they got lift struts which could hold the hatch back up. So our main danger zone is going to be directly in front of the car and directly behind the car. When we come up and attack these cars for car fires, our safest angles come in at them from the 45 degree angles. As you get close to the car, knock your fire down. Once we get the fire knocked down, we no longer have direct flame impingement. Now we can get close to the car and work on it and be pretty safe. We're seeing a lot more carbon fiber being utilized in cars as well as light aircraft. The primary concern we have with these guys is after car fires. When we've had a fire and then we add water to it, the result of those chemicals combining is hydrofluoric acid. The hydrofluoric acid has a really strong affinity for calcium. If we come up, we start putting our hands on the car after the fire, we can actually absorb the hydrofluoric acid in through the skin. Once it absorbs into the skin, it's going to start running through the bones and eating up the calcium. Primarily at the hospital side of it, their main function is they're actually going to start cutting off bone to get ahead of the hydrofluoric acid. If we're on scene and this happens, you, we notice that tingling coming out of our hands, the best thing we do on scene is actually take our calcium gluconate from the med kit. We can combine it with a KY jelly and actually make a cream and put that onto the burning area. What that will do, that has a higher calcium than what the bones do and it actually will draw the hydrofluoric acid back out. Even better for us to uh, prevent all of that from happening is after a car fires, before we go up and start touching the car, let's go ahead and just flush everything off really well with our water. From there, try not to touch things with bare hands. We put the car fire out, go ahead and put on some EMS gloves and if we're going to touch anything, that way we don't have bare skin touching the car and we should be pretty safe. If you don't deal with these hazards on a regular basis, it's easy to forget them. A good way to keep your mind fresh on this and be thinking about what you're going to do on scene is go out to the parking lot every now and then and look through the cars out there and identify the hazards and think about how would I handle this car, how would I handle certain hazards on these vehicles and go from there. Good luck.